Welcome to Rooftop Conversations. So as you can all see, we're not on my rooftop. That's because New York is getting very, very cold. It's becoming very, very windy on my rooftop. And it's becoming very difficult to film upstairs. So I decided to come downstairs to see and test out this format where maybe we can take the show down inside for the winter. Because, you know, in New York, it gets pretty cold. So today, I have an amazing guest who I'd love to, for you all to know. She's a young woman I met in undergrad while I was the president of the Feminist Club back in, on campus. This young woman was super passionate, super impressive, and is someone I'm excited to talk to today and to have you know, learn more about. Please welcome Nerissa Hajratali to the show. Nerissa, um, I mean, you're a woman who has done so much in her life. You've had different experiences. I guess you could say like you've lived like different lifetimes, right? With the different things that you've done, the mm -hmm. different experiences that you've had. But first, before, you know, we would begin with the real questioning, I'd love to hear about yourself. Like, so tell me about yourself in a couple of words. Yeah. Um, so I am a software engineer, um, recently graduated from General Assembly Software Engineering Immersive Bootcamp. Um, prior to this, I was working um, primarily in the healthcare industry. I graduated from NYU with a degree in neuroscience um, on the pre-medical track, um, and I got a lot of exposure to working in the healthcare industry, both part-time, volunteer, um, and full-time opportunities. Um, and then from my most recent experience, I worked at a, at a health tech company, and that kind of opened my eyes, along with a lot of my other healthcare experiences, of a lot of systemic issues that are present in the healthcare industry. So just working at, in the health tech space, I began to notice the ways that technology is helping mitigate some of these problems in the healthcare industry. So that really inspired my career switch to software engineering. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, I guess, a little bit about like my professional experience. Well, first off, congratulations on your graduation. Um, like, does, like web software engineering, web design, coding is definitely a passion, not a passion, I would say an interest of mine. It's something that I personally would love to know as well. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool to see more women in this field, especially women of color, really taking on this field and learning to code, learning to program. It's super awesome. So congratulations on your achievements. And I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so of course, like you didn't start off doing neuroscience. You didn't start off doing like software engineering right away. You actually did come to where we met we went to you went to the engineering school at NYU mm -hmm. and I just like to hear about your experiences being in that school as a chemical and biological engineering student and a woman of color so of course like I'd love to hear so you you know you didn't start off right away in software engineering and of course I'd love to talk about your journey from the the beginning so you actually started at an engineering school. So you, we met at the engineering school of NYU. And of course, you and I both know the engineering field, the engineering school is predominantly male. And the school was, I think, about like, at that point, like 70, 80 percent male. Mm -hmm. So I'd first love to hear about your experiences being in that school as like a woman of color and how that experience was like. And then what prompted your switch to do neuroscience and pre-medicine? Yeah, um, so Tandon was another world, um, as you know. Um, I remember on my like 25 to 30 person floor, there was one girl room, five girls in it, and I was one of the girls. Um, and it was, it was, I guess it was something I was used to because I took a lot of the like physics and, and math in high school. So I was kind of going into a space that wasn't totally new for me. Um, so that I was kind of didn't really notice it too much at first. Um, but it was something that was really cool is that the RA on my floor, she was also a woman and she was a Mackey, um, mechanical engineering for, for your viewers who don't know. Um, and, and she was really cool. So it was great to have that type of female leadership and right, like always present in my living space. Um, I haven't, when I was at Tandon, I never experienced any outright discrimination due to my race or my gender. However, just being the only woman in a 50 person class of like all men is a microaggression in itself. Um, and I'm not like, you know, Tandon was a great experience for me. It set up the foundation for my future. I was engineering, pre-med, and now I'm, I'm back to being an engineer again. Um, and I still met a lot of like really 
amazing and inspiring women in that space. And I'm really happy that Tandon is taking the steps to get more women into the field. Because remember, like when I switched uh, to College of Arts and Sciences, there, the numbers were definitely going up. The ratio was going up. So I'm glad they're bringing more like really inspiring women into the field and into the school. Yeah, I think uh, so. I have my friend's little sister goes there now. I think it is a little more. I wouldn't say like they're completely equal, but it's getting better. And now mm -hmm. there is the, the dean of the school is actually a woman herself. So that's mm -hmm. actually a big change that we have. Mm -hmm. So what prompted that switch from going from like CBE or as folks in who don't know, because Polly uses a lot of like acronyms and Tana mm -hmm. uses a lot of acronyms for majors. So what prompted your switch from being a chemical biological engineering student to doing neuroscience and pre-medicine? And then what was that experience like? Like, what, how was the switch like? How was that journey like? What prompted you to do that? And all, and all? Yeah, sure. Um, so what the semester switch was my sophomore fall. And I was taking like, that was past the basics. Like I took calc, I took chem, like the basics. And then I was taking the hard, hard stuff like MATLAB, linear algebra, you know, a CBE class. And I was really struggling hard. Um, and like MATLAB was like the worst, which is funny because like I'm a coder now and I like hated MATLAB. But um, like this is funny because like like now in like present years, people I've talked to who have taken MATLAB was like that was traumatizing. Like it really was. It was horrible. But um, yeah, so like I took a, a really distinct instance where I started like questioning my place in the field was like I took my first like CBE test and like I did really well on it and I was really proud of myself. Um, and the professor wanted like one-on-one -on -one conversations with all the students after after each exam to see how the class was going and things like that. You know, exam went well, meeting went fine. Second test, I like bombed. I did like one of the worst in the class. It was like horrible. Um, and the meeting afterwards, he made me feel really horrible about my performance on the exam. He was like, you know, I thought you were gonna be one of the top in the class. Like, why did you do so bad? And like, I'm not a perfect person. Engineers aren't meant to be perfect people. Um, and then from that point on, that kind of planted the seed of like, do I really belong here? Like, am I, am I smart enough to be an engineer? Do I have it to be an engineer? And then that coupled with being a woman of color in that space, I just really made me think like, I can't do this. You know, I need to pick something that I'm better at that I can get like immediate validation from. And so that kind of prompted the switch to pre-medicine and neuroscience, even though I've always said from when the time I was little, I never want to be a doctor. I don't know why. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where that came from, but I really like neuroscience. I already knew that I love life science stuff. I mean, I did want to do like, like chemical and biomolecular engineering. So I still wanted to stay in the same realm. Um, and I also really wanted to help people as well. So that, I guess that's where, what sparked the whole doctor conversation. Um, yeah. So I guess like, from that, I, I decided to switch and, and do the neuroscience route. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it sucks that, like, for a lot of folks in the STEM field, it's like you're getting that feeling right, where it's like you don't belong or, like, you're that imposter syndrome. And mm -hmm. that's something that we're going to go over, to, like, later on in the, the interview. Mm -hmm. You know, as a first-generation professional in the field that I'm in, I get that feeling all the time. Like it is, mm -hmm. it's, it's really real. It's really hard. It's something to get over and not to get over, but something that we're kind of like having to deal with all the time within ourselves and within our communities and things like that. But, you know, I'm glad that you're able to like leave that space and to eventually find a space where you feel like where you can actually like thrive and grow and, which actually leads to my next question about being in neuroscience. So Unfortunately, I've heard from so many folks. Um, you know, I was pre med myself. That didn't work out. Really? My yeah, yeah. That's I didn't know that. Way. Wow. Yeah, I was pre med myself, <laughs> but um, I'm not the smartest crayon in the box, so that's what happened. Stop, <laughs> but <stop>. anyway, <laughs> my brother is also pre med, and he's also said, you know, being in pre med brings out this very toxic environment. Um, mm -hmm. and that goes with like the student body and also just faculty. And I don't know if people's experiences differ with the schools they go to or whatever, but this is just something that I've heard and also the, like, the competitiveness of the field. So for you, um, you've also mentioned and expressed this to me as well, that your pre-medicine journey was kind of toxic. So I'd love to hear what that story was like and your experiences with that. Yeah. Um, so as you as you mentioned, with competitiveness, hyper competitiveness brings out the absolute worst in people. Like you don't want to help anyone. It's like you know, doggy dog type of world. It's like 
the even even the TAs would would encourage this type of behavior. They would like point out who got the highest grade in the class. You know, like oh, this person got the highest grade in the class. Like that that's just that's so horrible to reduce yourself to this numbers game because we're all complex individuals with different stories. What makes a good doctor is not your GPA. It's not a 4.0. It's not what extracurriculars you take. It's the experiences that you have in life and how you treat people based on those experiences. So that was something that I, I, didn't, I didn't like because I didn't think that me getting a 3.8 or getting a 3.9 would make me a good doctor. It was, it's what experience I had. And you know, med schools encourage this. They want the folks that have 4.0s. They want perfect MCAT. They want, they want outstanding extracurriculars, but these things aren't available to everyone. You know, we're gonna go over this in a little bit, but you know, who, who are these things available to? You know, you know I, I had the, the fortunate experience of like, you know, having my parents be able to support me while I was in college and I was taking some, some opportunities, like volunteer opportunities, but that's not available to everyone. Uh, absolutely not. And it's like, uh, okay, I'll, say, I'll save the whole, the whole spiel for the next question. But um, yeah, the, I, it just really brought out the worst in people. And it took me so long to unlearn these behaviors of, oh, I'm just a number or I'm just an extracurricular uh, opportunity. Like you have to unlearn these things to be the best version of yourself. And we're, we're bringing doctors into the field who are debilitated. Their mental health is debilitated because they're comparing themselves to this perfect standard that med schools want. So I, I just think that's just one of the many reasons why the system is not, is not perfect. It's not good. Yeah, why I know, say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so sorry that you had to face all that um, as someone who went through a very hyper-competitive environment as well, mm -hmm. being a lawyer. I can definitely relate to that in some aspect. Um, and it's true, right? I think a lot of this, like, and I'm, you know what, people know that I go on these like anti-capitalist rants all the time on here because that's just me. This is what you get. Um, I think it is, it comes with capitalism, right? It's just like, instead of having a collaborative environment where like, let's say I'm a med student or pre-med student, this of my other peer is also in the same boat as me. We're working on an issue. I'm going to say like, let's say treating a patient with coronavirus, right? I, I don't know. It's just a hot topic right now. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. why not? Why so not? it's like, why can't we collaborate on something, foster that collaborative environment where I work with my colleague to solve an issue, to ensure that my patient's doing well, and instead encourage this hyper competition between two people? Mm -hmm. What does that solve? Nothing. And we're going to go into the next question about systemic injustices in our healthcare system, right? Mm -hmm. It's broken on so, so many levels, both obviously a macro level where folks aren't able to get insurance and all that, but sometimes even the micro level. Um, You've mentioned like working in healthcare opens your eyes to a lot of systemic justices, injustices in our healthcare system. I myself have seen this in so many, like I don't mind myself, but like, you know, I myself as a fat person have seen that for myself, the way that medical biases has affected me. Um, you know, we've seen how black women uh, often face racial bias in healthcare. They're not given the care they need. They're not listened to. Trans folks are often treated with disrespect and like by doctors and healthcare professionals, class and wealth also play into this role. Mm -hmm. So like, what was the experience or the kind of that incident that made you really wake up or see these inequ inequities? And in what ways do you feel that healthcare has failed folks who are marginalized by it? And then on, a, on the flip side, what do you think we can do to fix these inequities? Both like either on a macro level, like something like proposing a med Medicare for all thing, or something like a micro level where, I don't know, maybe something like changing med school or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I guess some of the like very specific experiences that I've had is I had one opportunity where I was working in a research lab and we were specifically working with people of color who have psychosis. So schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Um, and a lot of the patients that I would see, unfortunately, so were homeless, like after the research, they would come in for the research study that we're doing, I would interview them and I would take the time to an hour, two hours plus to listen to their life stories. And what, like, how did they get to this point? What, like, you know, how, how did they end up being homeless or, or whatever other factors were playing into their lives? Um, and sometimes I would say, you know, I can't take my medication. I can't afford it. I don't have a stable home home to be able to take my medication or, or to manage like my health care, my health, basically. Um, and some of the instances that really it hit, hit me the hardest is 
when I would see people my own age coming in for these types of interviews that would be experiencing homelessness or have other, you know, home life problems and they, they, their health has suffered for it from it. Um, and it really just like opened my eyes to, you know, what, th this could have easily been me if I didn't have the privilege that I do. And they, they, there just needs to be some, there's no reason that someone shouldn't be able to afford their medication or be able to manage their medication. And, you know, I deal with my own struggles with my mental health and I'm fortunate enough to been able to afford those types of resources, but not everyone does. And then a second experience that I've had is I would used to be a volunteer at Planned Parenthood. So I was, um, you know, treating, helping, you know, women identifying people or, or, or not who are, have had procedures in the, um, like the waiting room afterwards, you know, either it was abortion, IUD um, insertions, things like that. Um, and just seeing how the accessibility of healthcare was just something, be, having that brought as an opportunity to them, how that's been able to change their lives. Like, you know, I've listened to stories from people of all types of backgrounds, people who, you know, are, are poor, people who are rich, like, you know, and just seeing like what healthcare can do for someone, it can change your whole life. So there's no reason that someone who should, who's wealthy should be able to get those resources and someone who isn't shouldn't. And I think the healthcare industry is not doing enough to address those types of problems. Um, and I think that you had a second question, right? Um, it was. Yes. So it was like, how do you think we can fix these inequities? So like both on a macro scale and a micro scale or like whatever solutions that you, per, you think is best to figure, uh, to solve this inequity. Right. Um, and I guess like, uh, you know, to go into that point, um, ways that we've like systemically failed them, which kind of touches on my previous answer about like pre-medicine and, and that industry is like, who are we letting into the healthcare industry? What doctors are we letting in? What barriers do we have in place to prevent a more diverse set of doctors into the field? You know, these, the, you know, high GPA, high MCAT score, you know, volunteer opportunities are not available to low income people at all. You know, someone that has to support their family can't go and volunteer, you know, 10 hours a week in a research lab, but that's what med, med school is expecting you to do. And it's like, who, do you have a doctor in your family? How, how highly connected are you? How much money do you have to spare for an MCAT course? You know, these, and, and we're letting, and it's like, we're letting in this cycle of doctors who are have this hyper privilege of at least finance finances for one, you know, and it, and privilege isn't a bad thing, right? Like I have privilege, we all have privilege. And it, it's not to say you can't unlearn that you can address things with empathy. However, are, are doctors taking those extra steps to be more empathetic to their patient populations? You know, are they, you know, you, you ex experience discrimination against doctors, you know, the, the black female mortality rate for after pregnancy is so high in comparison to white women. It's like, well, are they doing these, like, are they doing the work to unlearn their biases? And I think if we have more doctors in the field who are more open to these experiences and who have experienced a different perspective, we'll be able to change those types of microaggression and just change the overall system of care. Like, you know, so the people like you can get the care that you deserve. People, black women can get the care that they deserve. Um, and really amazing ways that tech is changing the healthcare industry. And that's one of the reasons why I transitioned back to software engineering. Like they're making birth control more accessible. They're making telehealth an option. They're making places in healthcare deserts, people that have to drive miles to their nearest doctor, they're bringing it right in the comfort of their own home. And, you know, that has its own problems as well. You know, not everyone has a computer, not everyone has a smartphone. The, the, these are deeply rooted systemic problems and it can, cannot be solved with an app. It cannot be solved with a web application. However, we're, we're doing, tech is doing great things to make it just a little bit easier for that black woman to get the care that she deserves. And, you know, that, that's just it. That's the reason why I, I decided to like kind of switch back into that industry. Yeah, no, definitely. I've like, thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, you know, I agree with that point, right? It doesn't take a high GPA or a high MCAT score or a high step one, step two score to make you a good doctor. Um, unfortunately, I've seen this in, there's a lot of parallels, right? To both the medical academic journey and the legal academic journey. I've seen this too, 
where I've unfortunately have been in, in classrooms with classmates who carry immense privilege, right? Coming from families with tons of wealth, connections and all that, but will have not even just microaggressions, but sometimes be bluntly, like explicitly racist or be mm-hmm. explicitly xenophobic or s- openly support candidates and political figures who, ex- who have openly expressed those ideas. And these are mm-hmm. folks who passed the bar, passed the LSAT, are now sworn in as attorneys. Mm-hmm. And those things, it's like very similar to the medical career, right? I don't think that, that one test will... <laughs> will change everything exactly. honestly like I'm a proponent of, to abolish the bar like you know, mm-hmm. that's a that's a big thing that I want to do but mm-hmm. um anyway I'm digressing and then, yeah I've been seeing tech play a huge huge role in closing that health equity gap right now there's different things like better better health like, like a lot of like or talk space that have bring mm-hmm. mental health into a telehealth space where maybe folks don't have the ability to take off from work and set up an appointment and go to a therapist Mm -hmm. um that Planned Parenthood has a UTI slash like birth control app where you just like click and get that from the pharmacy Norex is another birth control app so it's uh Project Ruby there's a whole bunch of different sites and I'm excited that folks like you someone with a very intersectional feminist leftist mindset is coming into this field and changing that game Mm -hmm. so you know you, you touched on it, right? You touched on why you wanted to come back into the engineering field, but if you could elaborate on that more, and then also the follow-up, you know, you mentioned before, right, when you were in NYU and you were in the chemical and biological engineering program, you felt like you weren't good enough, you were being talked down to, you didn't have a great support system, and you kind of faced imposter syndrome. So during your journey of you know, pursuing a career in software engineering, I'd love to hear how you personally were able to reconcile your feelings of imposter syndrome in your new career path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, so I think I think software engineering is becoming far more accessible to individuals than the healthcare space. You know, you don't need a college degree to be a software engineer. You can teach yourself and you can be a boot camp student. The program I went through is fully funded. The boot camp was sixteen thousand dollars, but I won a scholarship and I got it for free. And it was, yeah, it was a fantastic opportunity. It was like an Obama era scholarship that he set up for people, minorities, especially to get into the tech industry. Like my whole core cohort was a minority in the tech field. Either you were a woman and or a person of color. So it was really great to have those voices in the conversation when it comes to engineering. Um, and I was able to overcome a lot of the imposter syndrome because I was comparing it to my healthcare experience. You know, it was okay to ask questions. It was okay to feel like you didn't, you, you couldn't be an engineer. Like, you know, if you, if you showed any kind of weakness as a pre-med student, you, you get eaten by the sharks, right? You know, but when you're an engineer, everyone's trying to help each other because you're admitting that you can't, you don't know it all. And I think when it comes to like pre-medicine, you always want to one up everyone else you know that that's just not healthy um so i was able to like you know open up to that type of environment as opposed to where i was before um and i've overcome a lot of the imposter syndrome that i had just by being around the folks that that i've been around in that welcoming space um and then like one of like some of the sentiments i tell myself especially now like transitioning into this new field something that one of my instructors um told me like one of on our last day of class you're not doing this for yourself you're doing this for the next Guyanese engineer. You're doing this for the next Thai lawyer. You're doing this for the next person, not just for yourself. You're taking up space for everyone who comes next. And I really, really appreciated that. So if anyone ever feels down about yourself, just think about that. Thank you so much for that affirmation. You know, honestly, like as someone who is a first generation lawyer, a woman of color, Mm -hmm. someone who doesn't come from connections and you know, I face so much imposter syndrome. Every day people are like, so when are you going to run for office? Like, I get that question so mm-hmm. much per day. And I'm like, no, no, not right now yeah. because I'm scared. I'm not qualified. I'm not, you know, I'm not qualified enough. I don't have the degrees. I don't have the education. I don't have the practice. I'm not an organizer. I'm blah, blah. Like, all these excuses. Meanwhile, in the Oval Office, we see what we have. In, and, and I'm not even talking politics wise. I'm not, his politics aside, this man is unprofessional. <laughs> this right. man has, if we're talking like politics aside, beliefs aside, and all of that, this man 
as a per as a person in the seat of the president of the United States mm-hmm. is an unprofessional person. You do not conduct business like that at all. Yeah. The way that you the way that he's been acting on the social medias and the way that he's been passing these laws about mm-hmm. blocking people and all that. That's not how you act in a professional setting. Absolutely. Not at all. So even like, so if someone like that is able to sit in the highest position of government and get away with it, I think I'm okay. Right, right. <laughs> I think I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, obviously it's, it's difficult, right? I think for folks, if, especially if you're a woman or someone who doesn't identify as male, a cishet man, someone who's a person of color, especially if you're black and brown, it's yeah. so hard. You're always going to have these questions. You're always going to have these feelings. Um, and it's, you know, what are some things that you personally did to kind of like get over, not get over, but kind of heal from it. And then if you have some tips for the audience, including myself, because I yeah. also, honestly, to this day, I'm still like, no, I'm not good enough. I can't do this seeing that esq on the back the end of my name that signifies i'm a lawyer that still doesn't feel right to me because i'm like nah they don't accept people like me as a lawyer and you're like oh, you like me as a lawyer no you know mm-hmm. what i mean like it's still weird to even say that i'm an attorney it's still weird to even say that even though i have by on paper all the credentials and i did all the rec- like the requirements to become in this position mm-hmm. so yeah what are some ways for us to kind of like some affirmations and some tips and some i don't know so self-care tips for your experiences. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think one of the biggest self-care tips is just stop comparing yourself to any, I know it's like cheesy, everyone says it, but like stop comparing yourself to anyone else. You're, cause you should be like competing with yourself. You know, you should be always like striving to be the best version of yourself, but be okay with where you are right now. Like always be content with like, you know, if I never coded another day of my life, you know, I'd be okay with that because I've accomplished so much this far. You know, I know, I know I can be a better engineer and every day I'm striving to be a better engineer, but I know I'm already a good engineer. You know, I've, I've taken up this space as a woman of color in a predominantly white male industry and I've done that in a matter of four months I've done this boot camp in four months and that's a huge accomplishment so just don't like be okay with where you are right now but also see the see the future of where you can be um I think is my biggest tip I love it honestly like that's actually something I needed to hear today like I'm Mm -hmm. like the other day I was like I'm planning a new like career plan I guess we will just call it that for now <laughs> and not to disclose too much on, of my mm-hmm. personal life but you know I'm, I'm, I'm starting a new career plan in my life and I'm like I'm like telling my friends I'm like I don't really is this a good idea because like I don't really know like is, is it mm-hmm. time am I good enough I don't know I'm comparing myself to every person I see in this in this industry I'm like I'm not this person I'm not this person I'm not this person can I do it and my friends are just like okay, look, like, just breathe, take it one step at a time, you're fine, don't worry, if that person can do it, you can do it too, so, but it's hard, so thank you so much for, like, sharing that message, and I'm sure, like, a lot of folks, there's, it's not just the two of us in this position, where there's so, unfortunately, the world, that's the way it's set up, so much, so many of us are not, you know, like, have these feelings of insecurity, and have these feelings of imposter syndrome, yeah and you know it's a real thing unfortunately I think like it sucks but I'm so glad that people like you someone who is like like honestly when I first met you and I think for folks who know me personally I work off of vibes right I work off of energy and I think I gravitate to folks who show me good positive energy and I'm not saying like toxic positive energy more like you're someone that I can work with. You're someone that has this amazing spark in you. And I think like that's something I definitely noticed in you as a person when I first met you. And I'm so proud to see that you're you're at the you're at a point in your life where like you know you can do this. You're capable and like you're amazing. You got this in the bag. I think more importantly, like the fact that you're ready to like create change. I think like I respect people who pursue careers, whatever it is, medicine, legal field, political field, STEM, engineering. I like folks who use these talents to be able to create change and to make the world a better place. So I respect that you're doing this Mm -hmm. for that mission. And of course, like, thank you for coming on, right? And like you said, right, you want to amplify 
be like you being an engineer means representation and it goes back to when your experiences at Tandon you said that you were at the dorms and the, your RA was a woman who was also an engineer and that made you feel like much better about seeing representation mm -hmm. and now you yourself can be the representation for other Guyanese young women who want to be in STEM who want to be a software engineer and who are like okay well if Narissa can do it I can do it too mm -hmm. and I think that's the most beautiful thing and that's like the power that you have um as well so of course as part of rooftop conversations it's a community-based show I'm here to amplify the voices of folks of color, especially their accomplishments and achievements. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you would like me to promote? So any products you're working on, things that you want to advocate, causes that the audience should know about, or even something about yourself and your portfolio and things like that? Yeah, um, I have a number of pro bono projects that are in the works um, that I will share in the future um, once I start rolling. However, um, right now I'm just really looking for you know any projects or companies that have to do with social impact in that in the tech space um if anyone's you know hiring or taking on more engineers for their team i would love any kind of opportunities that are available um and i just finished my professional portfolio so i'll share that with you uh, afterwards it's narissa narissa-adratali.com um so yeah that's just that's about it and of course, all of that's going to be shared um, on the description below. Thank you so much, Nerissa, for joining. Um, I really appreciate it's been like, so when Nerissa and I were talking before, she's like, it's been five years since I like saw you. I'm like, yeah, I know it's, it's been, <laughs> it's been a while. I think that's like the beauty of like me doing this show is I get to reconnect with so many of my old colleagues, my old peers who, you know, like we're visiting, revisiting five years later, I'm seeing them do great and amazing things. Like, I'm like, I know so many cool people. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Makes great content for my show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Narissa. And of course, like, let us know how we can help you. And like, you know, we're here to support. I'm glad to see more Guyanese women, um, West Indian women come into the field and doing this amazing social justice work. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye. Bye.